Welcome to Leadership Jams, a conversation with Philippine Mtiki Tiki. Leadership Jams is an interview series from the Henley Center for Leadership uh, at the Henley Business School in the UK. The, the, our Leadership Center is a community of scholars and managers who really tackle challenging leadership and leadership development issues. You know, we really want to transform leadership and ultimately we are interested in creating positive change in organizations and communities and society. My name is Bernd Vogel. I'm a professor in leadership and the founding director of our Leadership Center. And I'm hosting today our first conversation in this series. Let me share you about the purpose of Leadership Gems. Uh, this series is really to learn from people across society about their involvement in doing and engaging in leadership. Think leadership as a life. Um, we will touch on leadership experience and practices of our guests, their philosophy, uh, and also their very personal learning that they've captured and gathered over life, the light bulb moments along their career. And how to better start to our Leadership Jam series with our guest today. We are delighted to welcome Philippine Ntiki Tiki. Let me introduce Philippine along a few highlights from her outstanding career. She's a vice president at the General Manager East and Central Africa for Coca-Cola International. Hence for our conversation today, Philippine is speaking to us from Nairobi. It also makes us proud that she's an alumna of the Henley Business School. She earned an MBA at Henley South Africa uh, a few years ago. In her current role, she's responsible for developing and ex executing business strategy across a number of countries in East and Central Africa. And she's also the first female general manager for East and Central Africa franchise. Before her current role, she had numerous other positions uh, in the Coca-Cola company for over 20 years. She started as a Kusile graduate for Coca-Cola in 1998. And then for over 13 years, she worked towards various roles um, in, the, in the bottling franchise in South Africa before then in 2011, rejoining the Coca-Cola company, where she was channel manager, head of commercial planning, and then a region franchise director for a group of countries. And in 1919, she started her current role. Hi, Ben. How are you? Great to I'm be very, here. I'm very Thank well. You. Thank you so much for joining. Um, it's a pleasure to have you have you around. Um, let me introduce you to our uh, uh, listeners out there. You know, Philippine, along a few highlights from her extraordinary career when we had the chance to you know, get to know each other. Uh, just a fantastic journey um, to look at. Philippine is currently the Vice President and General Manager East and Central Africa for Coca-Cola International. Um, for our conversation today, um, Philippine is hence speaking from Nairobi. Um, it also makes us proud, I have to say, that she is an alumnus, uh, alumna of the Henley Business School. So she earned an MBA at Tandy South Africa uh, a few years ago. In her current role, she's responsible for developing and executing a business strategy across 13 countries in Eastern uh, Central uh, Africa. She's also the first female general manager for, for that reason and in the franchise. Before her current role, she had numerous positions in her 20 year career uh, with the Coca-Cola company and is bottling partners. She started, for instance, as a Kuzili graduate for Coca-Cola in South Africa in 1998. And then for over four, 13 years, she worked across the franchise business in South Africa in various sales and sales managerial roles. In 2011, she rejoined the Coca-Cola company, first as a channel manager for sale for South Africa and head of commercial planning uh, but also region franchise director of a group of countries such as Zambia, Botswana, Namibia, and Mozambique. And in 2019, she became, like I mentioned earlier, the VP and general manager East and Central Africa for Coca-Cola International. Philippi Philippine is also a university graduate with honors in economics from the University of KwaZulu-Natal. And as mentioned earlier, we're delighted to say that Philippine uh, is an MBA student, a former MBA student uh, from us on Henley, South Africa. 
What a privilege to have you with us for our first conversation as part of Leadership Gems. So let me start um, a bit, with a bit of a look back, you know, to, to kick off. I mean, leadership is a, kind of a strange concept and, and a, you know, practice. All, you know, everyone seems to have an opinion about what it means. So, uh, and we also know from research and, and thinking that leadership can be very, very helpful and meaningful at the same time. So if I asked you, when you look at, back at your career, you know, when did you first think, you know, what I'm involved with, that, that feels and look like, like leadership, you know, when, when was that and why was that? Yeah, thank you, Ben, for that question. So uh, I would say about the second or third year early on in my career when I, you know, had the title already of leading people. It's amazing. I was already uh, in, in leadership position for more than two years. And only then did I start realizing, I think this is leadership. And really that moment was a moment of change. You know, when I started as a, a, you know, in a supervisory role in sales, you know, the business was doing well, you know, people, you know, we were growing, we were doing well, people were excited. And uh, about the, what's the end of the second year, things, the market changed, the dynamics changed, and the results were not as great as we had in the past. And it was a moment of change. Uh, the team, you know, the level of dissonance, the level of, you know, just, you know, disappointment, you know, a team that has gone through such a numerous achievements, all of a sudden the numbers are not coming to the extent that we used to, and they have to deal with really challenging circumstances. And in that moment, that's actually when I realized that uh, the team needs motivation, the team needs direction, you know, how do we deal with change? How do we deal with this difficult situation? And I have to provide, a, you know, a, a vision. You know, what does the next year, the next three years actually look like in this new environment? I have to build new capabilities for the team and for myself. So I think that, you know, as I say quite often, is that leadership really comes at the moment of change. At the moment of difficulty, that's when you realize this is actually a moment where someone needs to step up and lead the team. And it starts with actually leading yourself because you have to really, first of all, as you ask, you have to first realize that this is a moment that requires all the great things you learned about leadership to start applying them now. And did you... Um, it's it's interesting that you say it's kind of like leadership comes to you, right? You know, and knocks on your door to an extent. Um, yeah. And did you, when you started, you know, working in your your career, um, did you set out to get engaged in leadership, or was that far far away? Or, or so, how did you you think think about that early in your career? Um, you know, early on, I don't think. You know, just with the benefit of hindsight, it never really was the ultimate uh, outcome, you know, to say that one day I want to ha have the head of leadership. It's just about actually the fact that I, you know, I wanted to be in business. I wanted to go into this commercial space. It was never really about how do I become a great leader in the beginning. It is as the situation evolves and you grow and you develop and you come through different challenges and you continue to develop. But it was never an outright target, so to say, uh, from, a, from a career perspective. It was never this thing that I'm chasing as a person. Yeah. That's in, that, that's interesting. So if you think about, you know, the about the you know, the, the purpose and, and why you engage with leadership, you know, today, you know, I, you know when you when you say I'm setting out to engage in leadership with others. Um, so 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 what do you want to achieve? What's what's your specific purpose in this? Yeah, I, I think uh, the one thing is uh, you, you engage in leadership in order to create a work environment and a climate where different people from different organizations, from different backgrounds, from different experiences, can actually find a place where they can be the best of themselves towards achieving one singular vision. Because we are a business, we have a vision where we, where we want to go. 
uh, we have, you know, milestones where we want to achieve, and we have this group of diverse people. As a leader, the first task is how do I actually provide that vision that everybody can work uh, in an environment that allows them to thrive, to succeed in that in that particular way. And I think to be able really to do that, because I think it's easier said in one statement to say, I want to create a work environment and a climate to do that. So, you know, what is some of, you know, just learning from my own experiences, you know, what are some of the the things that you have to think about in, in creating this environment? The first part of it is, I think the most obvious one that always is stated is what is the vision that can get the entire team to focus towards. And once people are very clear about how to get there, and then you then say, um, how am I going to actually make sure that they are able to thrive? And one of the things uh, in my own experiences is how do you create an environment that is truly innovative, that is non-hierarchical, an environment where you are able to, to, to a large extent, to minimize fear of trying something. And in that way, people feel empowered. People will actually come up with ideas that you yourself as a leader have not thought about in terms of how to grow this business, how to, um, you know, how to find new sources of opportunities. And people want to know that every day in this workspace, I am valued, I matter. And it's the biggest leadership challenge to really balance what a person needs in a context of a lot of people, you know, uh, because people are at different levels of development, they have different aspirations. And uh, as a leader, you have no holiday, you know, every day how you show up, you know, what you say, what you do, communicates all the time. And in a way, it's a great blessing, but also it can be, a, it, it, it's, it's a lot of weight that you have to be consciously caring and also understand that you have to be consistent, you have to show up in a particular way. In that way, you have the, the team behind you, the team that is empowered, the team that is innovative, the team that clearly understand the boundaries and what needs to be done and what success actually looks like that you share with your team that, look, I'm struggling in this area. I'm struggling in this area. Also, have small children who need to do homework. I'm sure that there are people in that position. The more you share those kind of areas, you actually unlock another part of this, you know, relationship, this psychological contract you have with your team, and they start to trust you more. So you build trust in some way. It's so funny that by being a little bit more and, and being vulnerable, you build trust more than than really trying to show the strong person who who, uh, who has everything under control right yeah and it's a it's a it's a fascinating observation because it's this you know we in a way we move further apart but by that we create stronger relationships to make it work right and yes. through the uncertainty we, we all think in the first place how do we do that we also it's so transparent for everyone. We can't also keep this brand that all works actually up, you know, which we sometimes try to do. I think it's in quite interesting, healthy transparency then, then kind of encourages you to think differently. Uh, and all of a sudden we have, uh, you know, different ways of trusting uh, uh, that we've learned. Um, and I can echo from many conversations this early step and then to sit back and think, how do we really make this work? I mean, that leads me I, I, that leads me to the next question. And and so how do you how do you make sure that, you know, that your leadership practice, what you do evolves over time? So how do you keep learning? You know, how do you keep sharp and question yourself? Yeah, I, 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 one thing I think what I found is that the more I focus on personal development, um, self leadership, the more that I grow, and I, and I think that um, you know earlier on in my career it was about you know what is the framework of leadership, these are the things feedback. So we always get feedback all the time. At home, your children give you feedback. It goes so we always getting feedback. It's just the willingness to really listen and sharpen 
yourself as a person to grow as a person. So I think I've been able to evolve and, I, and I'm still learning even today uh, how to really be, uh, be continue to grow in the leadership journey. And I think that also one thing I've learned is that it's not about, re you know, getting rid of your weaknesses. It's actually some weaknesses you can't get rid of. But the more you are aware of them, the more you figure out what are the triggers that bring this kind of person in you that you really don't want to bring. <laughs> so you, you, you're you able to, to control. So I've really been very fortunate because I've had great mentors and and great coaches along the way who really, you know, just nudged me to the right, you know, direction and they give me some of the techniques and some of the skills. So the, the combination of, um, you know, classroom training and practice and, and really recognition that if it's going to happen, it's going to come from inside out. So that has been, I think, for me. But when do you know? Um, when actually to step aside and, and let others take leadership, being at your peers, being at your team members, and you, you, you really look work from the sideline, but knowing that, you know, it's, it's in a way your job, but here's really someone else to take charge. So how, are there moments when you do that and, and what would, would trigger that? Yeah, I, yeah, I think th there's definitely moments, a number of moments along the way. I think the one uh, thing is, is just to understand, you know, the, the people that you have around you, you know, what skills, what talent and what potential do they bring? And secondly, to understand your own strength. What am I good at? You know, and then in that way, you know, okay, if this task calls for something that I'm not, is not my first strength, let me give somebody who's better than me. And I think that is always, uh, I mean, Leadership 101, bring people who can complement you, people who are stronger than you, um, so that, you know, the whole pile works together. I think that is the first thing for me is when I identify that I have, I don't have the best skill to deal with this particular challenge and I'll bring the best people to um, to deal with it. Secondly, it's also, I think, in the concept of situational leadership, I would say that uh, there could be a task. Part of the task could be done well by somebody else. But when it gets to a particular, you know, if after the task has gone to a particular space, you know, you may you may be best to come back and deal with it and pass it on. It, it's almost like a you know a relay type of thing. Mm -hmm. you, you have to know who's better at starting, who's better at finishing, who's better at, at doing that. That kind of uh, you know thinking for me work I, I think works best. Um, and, and you will always leverage this. Everyone is growing, and you know sometimes some of the team members don't have the level of confidence of what they can do in that particular situation and you can use it to challenge them because you know if they really push one more inch they'll do a better job than you. So this combination of self-awareness, the combination of understanding who's good at what within your team and thirdly is really about in what situation is it better you know, handing down something to somebody and is, you know, when is it best for you to hand it? And I, I suppose when you're a leader, the more you hand over to somebody, the better you are preparing the whole team uh, for yourself. It, it I, you know, I, I like the leadership as a relay, you know, I think that's, that's really interesting. I have to say, I at least would we'll borrow that in the future, you know, <laughs> thanks for that. You know, um, but so, but, you know, there is often, you know, kind of opposing ideas. Now, some managers really, you know, have been brought up by shining themselves. You know, the main thing is that you shine, right? Yes. And and then we have, we know that we're not complete. So so we, we need, like you say, we need to involve others. But that's sometimes a real hurdle because 
because then how do I shine, right? You know, when 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 it's the others involved, and and that's why many struggle to do what you were just sharing. So how do you how do you combine this? Well, there is some, you know, there's responsibility, accountability. There's some need to shine, and at the same time, you know that you as a group and you create your performance and the things that you need to deliver better with others. So how do you how do you balance these two things? Yeah, very interesting. So the balance of self-reward and the reward of the team, you know, uh, the, you know, is this behavior going to help me get the, you know, the next job? Or if I feel I'm in the bag, maybe they make a mistake, they give some risk. So I think for me, it's, it's really you have to be very confident of what you what you as a person are trying to achieve. You know, and you have to be very clear, have a set of principle of what guides you as a person. And then you decide how you're going to live up to that. And in some instances, you may have started the fire, but somebody else is going to finish, cook, whatever, and serve. Maybe the person who's serving looks like they did the fire and they cook and they finished. I do think that it's really so personal what you want to achieve. And what can you make peace with and what can you make peace, what can you leave without? I, as a person, have a set of guiding principles that guides me every day. And those fundamental principles are the ones that I use in my leadership. If it's good for this person to do this and show the work that they've done, I am very happy with that. Mm -hmm. And I am not in competition of that because... Um, I think it's not good for the greater organization and the people to have people at leadership who really want to shine. Then, then you're not building the succession that you need. Then you're not helping people build the confidence that you need. And at the end of the day, I think at the end of the day, leadership will always, um, what is right will always be above what is wrong. In the short term, that behavior of being on the podium can win you a, you know, a medal. But the true trophy of really what true leadership is, is, is actually on the person doing right. What is, what is the legacy that I want to have when I live here? Do I want the legacy that says um, Philippine was the first GM, you know, and she did the following? No, it's about I want the people who work with me to have a very strong uh, memories of themselves growing. Mm -hmm. I want to be able to look back and say, wow, you know, this team of people who are now running that region, doing these things, I contributed in some way to help them move up. This for me is the success. I want to look back and say, this is, we, we got the business at this level. We took the business to the next level. This is how far Coca-Cola who've entrusted me to lead. I can say that we put back and served and delivered you know, the, the mandate, the vision that is there. And, and with us, we took people along the journey with us. If I would work for you, how would I notice that you help me to develop, you know, that you help me to grow? So on a, on a practical level, how would I, you know, what would you do, you know, or what would you facilitate so that I can, you know, at a very practical notice, ah, it's really about my development when I work with you and your team. Yeah, I think that's a very good question. So I, Look, one is um, for every person that's in my team, I I would sit down with, with you and ask you, what do you want? And I always say that is the starting point. And sometimes it's the most difficult question for people to answer. And I've been in that position as well, where it was hard for me to really say what I want. Because what I've learned is that if I say, I my task is to develop, to help you develop, the weight is on me and it's wrong. It has to be the other way around. I have to ask you, what do you want? Ben, what do you actually want? And then you will say, I want this. You know, what I found is that some people are very clear, some people not. And that question helps them figure out actually what they want. So we'll have like three conversations. By the third one, they're like, yeah, I, I now I'm sure this is what I want. I said, okay. Now, take some time to figure out where you are now, the people who are where they are, based on what you see, what are the things that you think 
are the gaps between you being here and you being there, and they'll have a point of view. I find that it's always important to learn what the person understands as mm -hmm. a point of view than me telling them because maybe they don't believe that is the case. And also it helps because sometimes people think they are ready. They're like, no, I'm already there. But hindsight also allows you to sometimes think back at things where we think, oh, you know, if, if I could only undo that, you know, if I could only do something different about that, where, you know, best intentions, but unintended consequences, or I didn't know better. So Uh, and I think that that's fascinating because that's part of life in a way. So if you look back, you know, if one or two things where I said, God, if I could only go back in time and 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 do do different, facilitate different, uh, because that was really not what I what I was uh, hoping for and aiming for. It, what what would that be to share with our listeners? Yeah, I think the the one example I will share is uh, I, I think. I was in my fourth year of, uh, you know, leadership supervisory role, and um, I had a, had an experience with uh, one of, you know, one of the employees that reports to me. One day, uh, she came to me and said, "Look, I am so exhausted. I'm so exhausted." Um, I am considering to to leave, and it was one of the most talented uh, employees I had. So it was really a step back and said, I mean, what went wrong, you know? And um, I remember I used to work uh, by 6.30, I'll be in the office and I'll leave 9 p.m. <laughs> That was me, just add more hours, you know, to the difficult challenge. And on that specific day, I mean, that feedback, of course, I, I said, look, stay. Um, but that day I decided, I, I actually packed my bags, I think it was midday, and I and I packed my bags and I, and I went home. Mm -hmm. And for the first time, I reflected mm -hmm. <laughs> to say, what am I doing? It's amazing. You are doing something every day, but you never really take the time To, to reflect. I'd not taken time. I reflect about the core of the business, but never reflecting about how I am leading people. And I went home and I, and I said, and I thought to myself, the intention of how I want to lead and how people are experiencing is completely disconnected. And one of the things that I, I learned from that experience was one, we were going through a very, um, a difficult patch. We were changing quite a lot internally, externally, the market was also changing. Um, and what I was doing, I was telling, you know, then we're going to do this today, one, two, three, four, five, not solving the problem. And then number two, people were mimicking what I was doing. People thought I expected them as well to finish at 9 p.m. and be there at 6.30. So even though people didn't think that it was a good idea to be working all these hours, they thought it was my minimum expectation from them. So I realized that you actually, not by saying, by doing, you are setting a culture you may not actually want. And in my mind, I never expected people to be in the office until I leave. So I learned that people actually were staying. And then when I leave, people were just, you know, starting their cars and going home. You know, you're senior in a senior position and as a female in a senior position and, and uh, you know, across the globe, we still, you know, don't see enough of that. You know, I think that's a brutal sentence that you that I can can put out there. And and, and so that in, in in that way, that's a it's a fascinating uh, way of, of, of looking at that. So so for you personally, as a, as a, as a you know, female senior manager. So so what works for you to thrive? Right. You know, what are the things? What's your environment, you know, in which you can actually create a career, create the influence, the learning, all the stuff that you said? Well, why did it work for you in, in a way that it did? And I assume you, you're pretty much involved in that. Yeah, thank you. You know, uh, this question uh, is always uh, very interesting for me because I get quite, quite, <laughs> quite a lot. And I don't know if I give uh, the exact same answer because I'm, I'm reflecting as, as we go, right? I think for me, it started with, and I always say this for, for people who are parents, it starts at home 
uh, how you were raised. So for a big part of my time, my life, I never really realized that there were gender differences as much because uh, my mother was a very anchor in, in, in uh, how we grew up. She's a very strong woman. She never separated tasks by gender. And um, so I would do the garden and my brother would cook and the sweet. it would just work by roster, okay? Um, you would climb the, the, the house and clean. I mean, she never, and I never really paid attention. Only when I started working, did I pay attention to the differences? And then I reflected, actually, my neighbors, they never really, the women were not climbing and cutting trees and doing stuff. And I realized the brothers never really coped, you know. And she always said this idea that actually the hands are 10 fingers and two. So she would, she would make that comment. But I, at the time, it didn't click why she used to say that. So when I got, only when I got to work did I really realized the, 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 the difference. And, you know, the fact that I, she was a strong woman, my dad was there, I never saw that things were not really the way society was working out, you know. So it starts there, I think, let's raise our children in a, in a, in a way that leverages their best strength. Okay, I, 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 if you don't like cooking, it must be that, not because you're women. And sorry, you will cook, but, you know, you will enjoy next time when your roster gives you something that you enjoy. Uh, so that was, I think, the first thing. And then secondly, um, I mean, the, the one thing for sure is that women are talented and are ready to lead. And I always start with that sentence in every platform I go, because uh, sometimes there's doubt whether women really, do they really want to lead or not? I think that that <laughs> they're really ready and they're able and we should create those opportunities. The other thing is I would support really what helped me a lot is mentorship and coaching. So I had really great mentors along the way. I had great coaches along the way, both male and female. And I put so much value to that because when the awareness came um, of this, and, and then I, I got people who just helped me how to navigate it. Um, earlier on, I actually ran operations, and in the operations at the time was really <laughs> like there were no women running the operations in that in that specific operations, right? And it was just about for me consciously bringing women in and also doing the work that people can see. Okay, actually, it's no, it's okay to have women, you know, uh, dealing in this space. So coaching and mentorship is very important. The other one is uh, we, we need a lot of support. We need support um, both in organizations and also um, I always advise women to create a network of support. So I have three children. So, you know, there's somebody who's going to help me with the kids when I'm traveling. There's someone. Who, so that, this net, this idea of a very strong network around you is such, it's always an advice that I always share with women that without the network of support, it is very difficult because I don't think we want to choose whether I want to have a family or not. Um, it's just how, how you enable this environment. And then the, the, the last thing I think that I just want to talk about is I'm privileged to work for a company that is deliberate uh, creating and driving the women agenda. So we have you know, quite a number of platforms called Women's Link, Women in Leadership, um, I actually sit in one of the, uh, as a, um, a council member in the Global Women Leadership Council for the Coca-Cola company. And it's such a privilege to do that. And I would say that a key part of enabling this is organizations also being very deliberate about this agenda. And it's also not about the numbers only, because sometimes we make a mistake to say, I have four women. Therefore, I check, check, you know, four women out of eight seats, 50%, I check the box. And then when you have that kind of way of achieving diversity, in two years' time, you lose, and then you start from the beginning. And then you say, but the women don't really want to be here. They, you know, whatever the, the stereotype that, you, you, you know, could be put, can be put. But it is actually about truly being inclusive that when the women are there, it's not trying to 
for the women to come in and fit in in what they mm-hmm. found. Yeah. Because this is not sustainable for anybody, you know. So it's how do we create an environment that is truly inclusive and for both women and men to thrive. And it's okay to talk about the agenda for women to succeed. And it should not, and, and who needs to talk about it is the people who are inside. So the, the, you know, in the board seats, in the decision making, it's, it's not the women who are inside. The, 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 the leaders who are male who are inside, unfortunately the burden sits with them inside to create the opportunities and for the door to open for women to come in. And then once women are in, is we have to play our role as well, is to continue to be involved and and uh, change and create an environment that is truly truly inclusive and it's not it's not also about swinging to the other way where we maybe 20 years from today we have no men then we start saying where are the men you know it's really really let's create an environment that is truly inclusive and to me inclusive means that anybody has equal is an environment where they have equal opportunities to succeed that it's, is truly inclusive. I, I think, you know, it, it, again, it's fascinating to listen. And, and we were talking about that earlier when we spoke. And I said, what a great question to ask by a middle-aged white man from the Western Hemisphere, you know, like myself. You know, but hey, that's where we are. And you just said, and I think the, the interesting thing is to look at, you know, it's again an, ecos- an ecosystem that needs to work. You know, it's not the burden is on, on women it's 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 on you know the system including men to make an inclusive what you call uh, ecosystem and and only then it moves um uh, you know and otherwise it, it 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 will not happen and and as we know it's to the detriment of organizations societies and individuals in these organizations you know and we're pretty clear so thanks for for sharing that at the Le- Henley center for leadership we we're always interested to learn what we what we need to explore and research. You know, if you could give us one advice to say, look, why don't you research this stuff and really get with some interesting answers, challenging answers, demanding answers, or just a solution? So, so what do you what do you ask us to do? <laughs> um, I think the one thing. I mean, I'm just talking something that is topical. I think the world is trying to figure out. Um, if you look at the recent uh, protests that have been happening in the US, um, I think it's not about the single event. It's about, I mean, just there's so much more demand about this topic that I talked about, about diversity, about true inclusion and access and opportunities in the workplace and anywhere in the world. And I think that if we were to because I, if I look at all leadership that I've attended, really doesn't explore the subject so much mm-hmm. uh, because it's evolving. And what was inclusion, hun- you know, 100 years ago, it's different from today and probably will be different in the future. And I think as leaders, we can benefit from more research of how do we really create an inclusive society? Because I, 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 I would love to believe at the core of a human being is to be good. You know, mm-hmm. we want to do good, we want to do well. The fact that we don't do it so well, it, it's not lack of intent. It could be lack of how. Yeah. And and also truly understanding. So I think if you continue to evolve the space and, and help and research more and help us figure out what inclusion actually means. And is there differences really by... Um, by race is a difference really by um, uh, age demographics are the millennials define uh, inclusion different from um, gen y and is the next generation going to define it very differently our perception of things have evolved also by the internet right the social media the speed to which information and the overload as well so how do we remove from the clutter and really figure this out, how, how it's done, because a lot of research was done that organizations that are truly diverse outperform those that are not. Which company doesn't want to do 20% better than their partner, right? But some way, somehow, it's difficult, right? So 
I, I think that would be an area that I think mm -hmm. is continue to evolve the body of work that exists in this area. I think that, that that's that's really helpful. I, I we have a, a colleague of mine, uh, Professor uh, Claire Collins, um, who you who you've met. She's uh, you know, involved in that research and also has a formal role at the business school. So we as an organization are sitting, you know, from an, what type of insights do we create? But we are part of the same story. Uh, and, and the second observation is this idea that, you know, what happened in the US, but also in other countries, you know, you know, some, somehow um, you, you kind of w want to hope that this is the opportunity um, to make another shift change in that journey across various diversity to inclusion uh, themes, you know, and 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 it's a bit like when you look at the pandemic, you know, I, I, these events. Sometimes I say we owe we owe that to the events, right, yes. and those people involved to really learn from that and and using that and as bad as the actual event is. So so, so we we'll, we'll have a look, you know. We continue, you know. One of our doctoral students is uh, is working on that. Basically, a number of faculty members. So thanks for that. Um, it, 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 one more question around, you know, there's a lot of myth in leadership, you know. So you know, borderline nonsense ideas. You know, if you could just kind of say, well, there's one one idea or myth in leadership that really gets on your nerve. You know how I would say that in my kind of more open question. You know, and you want to, I could get rid of that. What would that be? Um, you know, one of the, in my just experience, one of the myths I find um, is that when you have challenges of dissonance or challenges uh, of really getting people galvanized what's a course and really being engaged, you know, this whole idea of positive psychological contract, the way to fix it is that you have to come up with a list of initiatives. We're going to do one, two, three, four, five big things. When these are done, we're going to be fine. <laughs> and then you do all them, you finish, it's it's not moving. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. and, and people are like, and, you know, what's happening? <laughs> you know, and you start wondering if the people are, you know, don't understand the questions so they don't understand something. So one of the myths is that to truly build psychological contract, it's it's um it's a myth that it will be solved by a meeting and a strategic top five priorities. Yeah. <laughs> and haven't we all been there and sitting in those meetings where we had to listen to those, right? You know, and and you know, and it's all wasting our time, you know. And 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 if we're a bit more longer in the game, we already know when it starts that we're wasting our time, you know. We just find a way to express that. Well, that that's kind of you know our, our conversation today. So so thank you so much, um, uh, Philippine, to to make time, you know, and and let you let you us in into your life and your career and, and your learnings. I and I hope that also and and I've noticed, you know, your. Um, your idea around reflection. Also, that was an opportunity for you to reflect, you know, and take a step aside. So that's always our, uh, why it's a privilege, you know, to get your time. We also hope that this is another opportunity in a way, like, you know, to to step back. Uh, and and so, so thank you so much. And just, you know, so for uh, to end our conversation today, you know, for those who listened in, that was our first conversation, you know, from the Henley Center for Leadership uh, and its uh, Leadership Jams, you know, at the Henley Business School. The, um, uh, our guest today was uh, Philippine uh, Mitikitiki, and uh, she's the VP and General Manager for East and Central Africa at Coca-Cola International. Uh, I also like to thank our team who makes this happen. You know, it's it's again as always a team effort. In this case, a global effort in various places. Um, and so, a good, a great thanks uh, to them, and a great thanks to our listeners for time taking time to listen to this conversation. We hope that this really inspires, you know, their reflection wherever you are and wherever you do leadership in various areas of the world and in your life. Uh, and I'm only, you know, ending with the idea, stay tuned for our next iteration uh, of Leadership Gems. Thank you so much and thank you to you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Certainly enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you.